Oh, we've got a good one today as I break down the cult classic Samurai Cop. What's an all-American girl like you doing with a geek like this? There's a nurse in there giving him an injection. He's burned pretty bad. A movie about a heartthrob of a cop named Joe who doubles as a deadly samurai. All of the combat scenes, which are more than plentiful, were lightly choreographed or improvised only 15 minutes before filming. You might not believe that it wasn't fully rehearsed before shooting, but don't worry, it shows. Before the movie starts, you might want to shield the eyes and ears of your partners because Joe will absolutely seduce any woman who looks at him. There's no shame in protecting our dignity from this womanizer. You've been warned. Although the movie appears as perfection on the surface, it actually had a very difficult upbringing. The main actor for Joe had no experience with weapons, which was a difficult predicament considering his role of being a samurai cop, master of the sword and gun. He also became frustrated with the lack of multiple takes and cheesy dialogue, sometimes intentionally screwing up the scenes to spite the director, assuming that they would just be removed later. Luckily for us, many of these scenes have not been removed and are present for our enjoyment. Most of the scenes were filmed in one take, some even without audio. The audio then had to be dubbed over post-filming, but many of the actors were not able to actually come back to record their voices. Fortunately for the production though, the director had a plan. He recorded his own voice, but distorted it to sound a little bit different, resulting in a robotic voice that doesn't fit the tone of the scene. The terrible scenes are even more evident because there is no real plot to keep our focus. All of these instances unbelievably led to a direct-to-video release in 1991. The film now has a cult following and although considered terrible by critics, has been deemed the honorary So Bad It's Good title. Anyway, let's enter the world of Samurai Cop. Good luck. You're not an established gang yet, my friend. You should be very cautious. The movie starts out with two gang members speaking about making a treaty with every gang in the area. That there's enough turf for all of them to work cohesively as one unit. They want to team up with every Japanese and Chinese gang nearby. However, then comes Fujiyama. Here comes the boss. Fujiyama makes all of the decisions for his gang, the Katana Gang, and believes it's best to kill the leader of the local Chinese gangs and work only with the Japanese ones. The two gang members don't agree with this order, but understand that they must obey because it is the order of the Katana. I do not agree with the fight. It is up to the boss. It's the order of Katana. We fight. All right, so this is about as much plot as we get throughout the movie. Be prepared to feel underwhelmed and understimulated with the story. Good thing, though, we have some top-notch cringe interspersed with sexual tension and corny violence. The Katana gang meets up with a local gang to see if they'll work with their leader, Fujiyama. This is where we get a first glimpse of that magnificent post-processing audio dubbing. Have you decided to work with us? In no way we go under Fujiyama's flag. Come on, come on, let's get going. Move it. You did it. The job's done. We are introduced to our two main protagonists, a transferred cop from San Diego named Joe, who is tasked with assisting his partner, Frank, to catch them some bad guys. We're gonna go catch us some bad guys. The men head off as we are introduced to another comrade tasked with scoping out the bad guys from a helicopter named Peggy. Meanwhile, we catch a glimpse of two men with nefarious plans to drive off in a van. Joe tells Peggy to keep an eye on the van because it's stashed with a lot of cocaine and they don't want it out of their sight. Peggy affirms this command and tells Joe to keep it up. Okay, Joe, keep it up. Oh, it's up and ready. Uh, you just keep it warm. It's warm and ready. The bad guys find themselves at a marina where they make a transfer of goodies with another boat. We see two more men in the back of the van hiding out with some guns, ready for action. 
Joe and Frank witness the van men stash the briefcase in the back and drive off. They can't let these drugs enter the community, so they pursue to an epic theme song. They run into some trouble along the way and get into a shootout. Shoot! Shoot him! Ah, hold on! Ah, <laughs> uh, you got him! Joe doesn't know how to swerve and uh, runs over the gunman. Oh. oh, man! We end up seeing a lot of repetition with this chase. A gunman comes in and shoots. Joe says, shoot him, and Frank shoots him. Shoot! Shoot him! They do some off-roading, trying anything to stop this van. Joe almost cuts them off while frustratingly shooting at the van. Finally, Frank hits the driver in the ear and the van goes crashing into some boulders, resulting in an overreaction by the van and great stunt work by a man who does not know how to stop, drop, and roll. I understand having a stunt double, especially for a scene involving being lit on fire, but come on, this stunt double looks almost directly at the camera and looks nothing like the actor from the van. I don't understand why this guy couldn't have just been the actor for the van driver. It's not like the other guy had a major role or even talked. Oh, the hindsight on this one. Good job, guy. Call for a celebration. You got it. I'll see you back at your place. Fujiyama's number one man, Yamashita, explains what Joe's intentions are and the threat that he poses to their gang. So they call him Samurai, huh? Yes. His real name is Joe Marshall. They call him Samurai. He speaks fluent Japanese. He got his martial arts training from the masters in Japan. He was brought over here from the police force in San Diego to fight us. Fujiyama seems a little heartbroken that Joe would do such a thing. To fight us? To fight me? To destroy my operation? To kill you and my other men? To put handcuffs on me? And put me in the gas chamber? He's also a bit pissed off that one of his men was taken alive, but badly burned and in the hospital. So you know where our man is? Yes, boss. I know the hospital and the room. And he's burned bad. Real bad. Apparently, he is unable to talk, but Fujiyama wants to make sure of it. He orders Yamashita and a woman to the hospital to kill him. Fujiyama wants them to bring his head so that he can display it on his piano, a warning to everybody else not to be captured. As Fujiyama settles the expectations for the beheading, we head to the police department where Joe is telling a very interesting story. So, I'm lying there in bed with probably the most beautiful woman I've ever met in my life. Hey, what are you talking about? I'm just kidding, you know you're number one. And I know I'm gonna get the speech from Captain Roma. I told you guys I don't want any more dead bodies. But what am no. I gonna do now? The captain gets angry at them because they're both supposed to be at the hospital keeping an eye on this new prisoner from the Katana gang. Hi, Joe. Hi, Elkie. Hello, sir. Joe. Hey Steve, how you doing? We arrive at the hospital with our two cops, as another one explains the situation to them. What's going on, Steve? Not much, sir. There's a nurse in there giving him an injection. He's burned pretty bad. Let's check it out. We see some top-notch acting with nothing at all out of the ordinary. I'll be taking down some serious notes from these Oscar-worthy portrayals of incredible acting. How is he? Do you think he'd be able to answer a few questions? No way, his lips are burned. So what, he'll never be able to talk again? Oh, he'll talk again, but you just have to give him a couple of weeks. Next time, guys, catch him in one piece. 
Thanks, nurse. Joe and Frank follow the nurse outside of the room when their dialogue takes an incredible turn. Do you like what you see? I love what I see. Would you like to touch what you see? Yes. Yes, I would. Would you like to go out with me? Uh-huh. Yes, I would. Would you like to fuck me? Bingo. I'm not sure about the nursing school that she went to, but she sure knows how to take care of the horn dog Joe. The looks that Frank gives us is also spectacular. He gives a look mixed with amazement, intrigue, and proper eroticism. Unfortunately, the nurse checks what Joe is packing and does not seem to be impressed. Well then let's see what you've got. Doesn't interest me. Nothing there. Nothing there? Just exactly what would interest you? Something the size of a jumbo jet? From the nurse's perspective and Joe's commentary, we can infer that Joe's penis is somewhere between the size of an ant and a jumbo jet. They didn't really get into specifics. Have you been circumcised? Yeah, I have. Why? Well, your doctor must have cut a big portion of it off. No, he, uh, he was a good doctor. Good doctors make mistakes, too. That's why they buy insurance. Hey, don't worry. I got enough. It's big. I want bigger. Hey, I have a... <laughs> Pause the video and reflect on your life and see what it would be like if you could be in Joe's world. Replay it to get motivation of how a man remains secure. It's big. Okay, Steve. I want you to watch the room and watch it good. You got three more officers coming to assist you. And remember, no one goes in the room except for doctors and nurses. Got it? Okay, Joe. All right, let's go. All right. Hey, hey, where are you going? I have to change the trash. Is that all right? All right. Luckily for the Katana gang, Steve does not check credentials. Yamashita pops out of the trash bin like a wormy, moves on over to the patient, and slices his head off with a katana. The woman and Yamashita harness their internal Autobots and roll out, successfully escaping from the hospital unit. Get up! Good job. As they head outside, they start getting harassed by people trying to talk to them. Hey, wait a minute. I want to talk to you. Ah! Oh! Hey, wait a minute. Stop. Ah! Oh! Come on, come on. Let's get going. Move it. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Hey, wait a minute, doctor. I'd like to talk to you. Hey, wait a minute seems like such a niche saying, it's amazing that four different people said it within one minute. Can I see some ID? <laughs> the captain brings Frank and Joe into his office and reams them a new one. Everything you did was wrong. You're the one that talked me into bringing this moron from San Diego to fight the J Japanese Katana Gang. The Katana Gang is still going strong and now they have injured officers in the hospital. The captain is worried about losing his job and says that Joe caused so many issues but has only been there for one week. This man has been here one week and I almost lost my job. If he's here one more week, I might well end up in jail and die of a heart attack and I don't like that. Hey, I've been here one week. And just how long will it take you to bring him to their knees? One week? As the sexual tension between Joe and the captain grows, Frank mediates the situation by asking to give him a second chance. That him and Joe will work to take down the gang. That they need Joe. You're on your way to San Diego and I'll write the order. Hey, hey, hey Joe. Let's just let's wait. Let's wait. Now, why don't we give Samurai here a second chance? Because I need him. We need him. So why don't we just help him and support him? All right. God damn it, get the hell out of my office. Get out of here. I don't want to see your face. You son of a bitch. Come back here, you motherfucker.
What happened? You out or in? Baby, I'm always in. Okay, Mr. Joe Samurai, now that you're in, I've got some interesting news for you. What is it? Well, it seems there, there's this restaurant. The officer obviously stumbles over his lines, but they decided not to re-record it. I stumble over every one of my lines at least once while filming these videos. And I'm not even a professional, professional filmmaker. Well, it seems there, there's this restaurant, Blue Lagoon on 3rd Street near downtown. Well, Mr. Fujiyama, the head of the Katana Gang. This is where he's been hanging out. Remember when Yamashita was talking about Joe and saying that he was a master samurai and fluent in Japanese? Well, we finally get a look into his fluidity. What does katana mean? It means Japanese sword. The officer tells Joe that two other rival gangs to Fujiyama's katana gang are willing to work with the department. They're both rivals to the katana. All right, both of those gangs are willing to cooperate with us. They're afraid of katana. That's why they're willing to help us. All right, in time we'll use their service, but not now. Right now I say you and I go pay a visit to this Blue Lagoon restaurant. Joe decides that they will hold off on the services of the rival gangs for now and instead head to a restaurant, the Blue Lagoon, to try and talk with Fujiyama himself. You want to go? I can't, but I'll be home later on. I may stop by, so uh, keep it warm. Good thing with modern technology and use of the crock pot, she should be able to keep it well heated until Joe arrives later in the evening. Jennifer, I have a small present for you. <sighs> Thank you, Mr. Fujiyama, but I don't know if I should accept that. Please, take it. Thank you. It's beautiful. Hey, Tony, you're late. Oh, sorry. Please have a seat. Thanks. Joe and Frank enter the restaurant with their immense masculinity in tow. They approach the table to speak with Fujiyama as Joe displays his ability to maintain subtlety. Are you Fuji Fujiyama? Yes, I am. Who are you? I'm a cop. So you're the infamous boss of this shit katana gang, huh? Down. It's amazing, really. The back and forth between Joe and Yamashita while the intense sounds shine through, the threatening body language, and blunt stares of Frank are truly masterful. Look, officer, you have no right insulting my client. The lawyer says that they cannot harass his client, Fujiyama, without any evidence of crime. Frank explains that they do indeed have a lot on him. You have nothing on him. <laughs> and yes, we have. We have many things on him. And this client of yours is gonna need more than a lawyer to clean up his shit. But Fujiyama rebuttals with a nice monologue about the free world. Officers, if you have anything against me, then book me. Otherwise, as they say, get the hell out of my face. This is America, land of freedom and law. A man is innocent until he's proven guilty. You have nothing on me. Oh, I got a lot of shit on you. The other woman seems slightly impressed with Joe, which we know by now that every woman in this movie is at least slightly impressed with Joe. Anyway, I'm gonna play the upcoming dialogue how it's shown in the movie. It's so good that I don't wanna disrupt any of it. It starts off with Frank and the lawyer getting after it, and then a one-up monologue by our hero, Joe. I'll sue you and the department for this insult to my client. I'll file the case first thing in the morning. Hey, counselor. You still have three or four hours before the uh, courthouse closes. <laughs> now I'm telling these son of a bitches that we respect the Japanese of this country who are honest businessmen. And yeah, this is the land of opportunity for legitimate business, not for death merchants who distribute drugs to our children through schools and on the streets. Now I'm telling these motherfuckers that if they continue killing our children, to make their precious millions that they deposit in their secret Swiss bank accounts. Counselor, before your lawsuit even gets off the court clerk's desk, I'll have their stinking bodies in garbage bags and ship them back to Japan for fertilizer. Got it? After Joe's incredible display of honest brutality, while maintaining a caring attitude, he gets to the real issues at hand. By the way, what's an all-American girl like you doing with a geek like this?
two rounds. After laying their balls on the table, Joe and Frank leave the gang to think about what the fuck just happened. Hey, counselor, <laughs> we'll see you in court. <laughs> On their way out, Joe asks the waiter about the blonde girl, and we get a very uncomfortable conversation. A so bad you might want to look away type of conversation. Who's that blonde girl? Oh, her name is Jennifer. She's the boss. The boss? You mean she owns this place? Her mother owns the place. Where's her father? Ben. Killed? Who shot him? He. Who? Him. Who's him? Himself. Oh, he committed suicide. Yes! <laughs> Listen, when you see Jennifer alone, tell her, tell her I think she's very lovely. I'll do that. What's your name? Alfonso Rafael Federico Sebastian. This is my first name. Uh, what's your last name? Oh, uh, that's all right. We just need your first name. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye-bye. I'm not my cousin. I know you. Why didn't you let me hear his last name? Ah, oh, come on, man. His last name would have made a book. Hey, check it out. After making it back to the car, they notice Yamashita with a group of hooligans, ready to start some trouble. Joe is incredibly skilled at fighting and takes out most of the men barehanded. He punches with fury and the fortitude to withstand years of attack. Idiots! Get my men, dead or alive. One gang member wields a katana as Frank distracts him with a well-aimed bullet. Joe's able to wrestle the Japanese sword out of his hands as another man with a gun shows up to the party. Freeze you motherfuckers, leave him alone. Just a heads up to people who may not want to see a lot of fake blood, you probably want to look away until the screaming stops and you hear, damn. Uncuff him, I'm in, uncuff him. Ah! Damn. If you looked away, then you missed one of the most realistic arm severings of all time. It did not look at all like a plastic inflatable severed arm prop. Frank, look out! Yamashita has had enough and decides that spraying bullets from his Uzi and killing his men is easier than discussing his feelings with Joe and Frank. He lobs a grenade and then casually walks off, assuming that the officers have been dispatched. God, man, look what they've done to my car. Captain Roman's gonna burn my ass. Yeah, he's gonna burn it. Charcoal black. <laughs> it is black. Right on. <laughs> After the first real intense fight of the movie, we are brought back into the captain's office, who is angry at Fujiyama's lawyer for attempting to negotiate and do his job. I don't give a damn. But Captain Roma, let me warn you. Fuck you and your client. And you get your ass out of my office, or you'll have to go to surgery to get my foot out of it. Get out of here, you asshole. Leave me alone. I got more important things than a shyster like you. Get out of here. I'll see you in court. You motherfucker, I'll see you in hell. Leave me alone. Get a job. Joe, being the lady killer that he is, decides to go and meet with Jennifer at the Blue Lagoon restaurant. Hi. Hi. I was in the neighborhood. Thought I'd stop by to see you. He explains that he's clearly there just to be social and definitely not there for police business. Police questions? No, no, just friendly conversation. But my visit today is simply social. Why? Well, let's just say, I think you're very pretty. And they call you Samurai? Seems you know a lot about me. They talk. Who's they, your Japanese friends? Joe goes on to speak strictly about police business, asking why she hangs around Fujiyama. Jennifer explains that her family fell on hard times and struggled to keep the restaurant in business after her father ran out with most of their money. Fujiyama lent them money for the restaurant and now feels like they owe him. Joe, with his large forehead that doesn't fit on the screen, explains that Fujiyama cannot be trusted. You see, whatever he's done for you doesn't mean anything. And the money that he spent on you in this restaurant is drug money. Dirty. 
See, guys like Fujiyama make millions of dollars every year in this town by selling drugs and destruction. After laying down how she should view Fujiyama and his gang, Joe spits some courting game. I suppose being the restaurant owner, you must eat here quite a bit. Yeah, day and night, why? How would you like to eat somewhere else for a change with me? Tomorrow's Friday, and uh, that's one of our busiest days. Very quickly before listening to Joe's smooth tongue, you may be wondering why this lion made of yarn seems to be a focal point in this scene. That Jennifer seems to always end up in the same frame with it. Like me, you may have thought that there was a camera in there and Fujiyama was spying on Jennifer. Or that it had some symbolic meaning to be explained. Fun fact, you and I are both wrong. There's no meaning to this lion. It's simply there for looks. All right, Sunday. Sunday it is. Sunday I go to church. Besides, Sunday's my birthday. Oh, Sunday's your birthday? Well, happy birthday. Thank you. What church do you go to? The Episcopal Church in Beverly Hills. Ah, the Episcopal Church. That's very nice. Well, it was nice meeting you, Jennifer. You too. See you later. Bye. As Joe is leaving the restaurant, the ambiance turns moody as four calisthenic men threaten him. Don't move. What are you going to do, shoot me? Maybe a little later. Right now, I got orders to break both your legs. Come on, let's go. Move. Joe takes out the first man easily, but gets held up by a badass bat boy. Stay back. This guy's mine. Just kidding. He gets kicked in the nuts and Joe finishes them all off. One of the men understands that the predicament is not looking too hot for himself and figures it's best to flee. He fumbles down the stairs and runs off, with Joe directly in tow. A nice doggy tries helping Joe, but the fence holds him back. Alone without a doggy to help, Joe continues the pursuit. The gang member runs into a parking lot and trips over the flat asphalt as he's pinned down by our man of steel. Tell me who hired you. I don't know. Don't lie to me or I'll break your fucking wrist. Now tell me. Uh, Uncle Mura. Uh, Uncle Mura sent me. Which one is he? Oh, he's, he's the big bald man. Joe finally gets the man to talk as he spills the truth that Okamara sent him. He orders the man to give him the address of this big bald man. All right, I need his address. If Okamura is here, then we'll arrest him. And we'll have a solid case against the Katana gang for hiring four assassins to kill a policeman. As they come up with a plan, three of them get in some raunchy jokes back and forth about Frank possibly losing his cock. Who's going to answer to Captain Roma on this? You. <laughs> Shit, man. You burn my ass. You don't have to worry about that. It's already, uh... Ready. Yeah, 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 I know. It's already black, huh? <laughs> this time he probably cut my dick too, huh? You better come to my house before you report to the captain. For what? Let's use it before you lose it. <laughs> Joe says in order to catch Okamura, they should split into teams and surround the house. Hey, preacher. Yeah? You and I got nothing to do. Let's fuck. Shut up. Strategically, they all work their way around the house and find it overrun with gang members, inside and out. Freeze. They spy on Okamura inside, ready to have sexual intercourse with a lady. Is that him? I guess so. Looks like this is his last fuck. Joe splits up the good time, but forgets to open the door first. He struggles to get it open, and Okamura tosses the woman aside and kicks up out of bed. Freeze, Okamura! Luckily, Joe's able to enter and runs through the house, looking for Okamura. After some shootouts and continual chasing, Joe corners him in a yard. You gonna shoot me? Or fight me like a man? I hope you are ready for some historically accurate samurai fighting because we get some of the best choreography and fighting skills in recent times. Yeah. 
We all understand that Joe's hair is iconic to his overall character. But after the initial shooting, he had another role and had to cut off most of his hair. During the reshoots of Samurai Cop, he had to wear a wig, which uh, we will see as slightly off from his normal hair. It's obvious in this fighting scene, especially right here when Okamura nearly pulls off his entire wig. Let me just slow this right on down for you so you can take a nice look at this wig. Joe eventually gets the best of Okamura, as he appears to exercise the demons right out of him, as well as assuming a position looking like he's about to take a shit on Okamura's lower back. He's under arrest. Watch his arm, I might have broken. Looks like you did. As Frank is doing the arrest, his gun is taken by Okamura, who then attempts to shoot Joe. Luckily, Joe takes the power stance and ends Okamura's rebuttal. Holy shit. We have some problems in the police department. We have several new enemies. Yashimoto and Fujiyama figure out what they should do next. They realize that a lot of the officers in the department are a problem to their business and need them out of the way. Fujiyama comes to the conclusion that these officers cannot be bought off, but they cannot be killed either because then the gang will be suspect. Fujiyama decides it's best to hire hitmen from New York to teach them all a lesson. But we should punish them somehow. Call New York and get somebody to break both of those summer cops' legs. We are brought back to Joe and some guy that are doing some sort of investigation. Take some notes from Joe's outfit because he is dripping in swagger. Who could shoot this in a mafia boss's house? One of his own men. Some men, I'm assuming the New York men, show up and ask where the man with the ponytail is. Where did the tall guy with the ponytail go? The woman at the desk tells them that he's upstairs and almost immediately realizes it was a mistake. Can I help you? We are just a little business with him. She's able to casually move her hand over to the warning bell and ring it. That's a warning bell. Oh yeah? Wait here. Because of the warning, Joe is able to surprise the hitman and become a hitman of his own, taking power stances along the way and showing them that from a down low angle, his face appears much smaller than his head. After taking out all of the hitmen, it abruptly cuts to the next scene. <laughs> I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Yeah, boss. I'll be there right away. Joe is then brought back into the spotlight, looking very cleaned up, like a samurai version of Patrick Bateman. He cannot contain himself and meets with Jennifer after her session at church. He says that there are more questions that she needs to answer and takes her to his personal police station. So this is the police station where you're interrogating me? This is the place. Disappointingly, word gets to Fujiyama that Jennifer has left with Joe. Because Fujiyama wasn't able to gain the love of Jennifer, even after being her friend and buying really nice gifts, he does what any failed white knight would do after not being able to secure the lady. Kill him. My pleasure. This chicken, I have a neighbor next door, and she has farm animals. And what I did was I jumped the fence. I stole one of her chickens and then killed it. Great. Because I really wanted to impress you. So I hope you're impressed. Satisfied with his humor at the situation, Jennifer asks Joe about his natural instincts of seducing women. How did you know I'd come home with you? Let's just say I can read eyes. Meanwhile, Yamashito breaks into one of the officer's house to find out where Joe lives. 
So I'm just gonna skip over this scene because I don't find it very funny or integral to the story. They abuse and kill the officer's wife and then kill him as well. Literally right after showing the death of this officer and his wife, they immediately cut to a naked Joe and Jennifer seducing each other on the beach. The hitmen find out where Frank lives and go to his house, hoping to get information about where Joe lives. They then threaten to cut off his gift. Yeah, <laughs> kill you now, or I can relieve you of this gift, this black gift. He's able to dupe the men, saying that the address is written inside the pocket of one of the coats in the closet. As they are distracted, Frank is able to find a nice knife and hold one of them hostage. He steals one of the man's guns and assumes control of the situation. You love cutting people, huh? Now you're gonna get it. Joe and Jennifer are too distracted by each other's bodies that they are unable to hear Frank attempting to call and warn them of the imminent threat potentially coming out to kill them. Somehow, as everybody is getting tortured and the entire department is in the middle of an intense investigation about a gang murdering and selling drugs in their community, these two have more important matters to attend. I'm hungry. Me too. Yamashita finds Joe's previous lover, Peggy, and breaks into her house. The men sneak through one of the windows and confront her. She's able to fend them off for a bit, but cannot keep it up. They hold her down and pour hot grease onto her stomach, forcing her to give up the location of Joe's hideout. Again, as all of his partners are being tortured, it abruptly cuts to Joe, still busy attempting to sleep with Jennifer. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jennifer. Happy birthday to you. After celebrating her birthday, Joe finally gets what he's been waiting for and what we've been waiting for, a view of Joe's butt in a Speedo. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins as a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. This wouldn't be a shitty B-movie that we all love if there weren't as many non-integral sex scenes that don't drive the plot in any way possible. But this one finally led to Frank getting a hold of them and them answering. Come on, Joe. Hello. Listen, get out of your house. I mean, I mean fast, get out fast, man. Those guys are looking for you. Looks like they're already here, gotta go. Which makes me wonder, did they celebrate her birthday and have sex all in the matter of one minute? Because I would assume that Frank would just continue to call until they finally answered. He called first while they were in the pool and then again right after they had sex and were just laying in bed. It's another thing to think about in this thought provoking film. Anyway, him and Jennifer make it outside and send one of the men swimming. The intense music signals that more shootouts were bound to happen, and that's exactly what happens. You can run all you want, but you'll never get away from me! Oh. 
So right after surviving a life-threatening gunfight, Jennifer decides to go back to the restaurant and explain to her mom that she isn't worried about anything. She doesn't care that Fujiyama bought a bunch of gifts for her on her birthday because she is in love with Joe. I don't give a damn. And you know why? Because I'm in love. Meanwhile, the captain brings Joe and Frank into his office and is disappointed that they never brought one of the gang members in alive. Fortunately for them, he doesn't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. There's only one thing in this world I want. I want you to find that motherfucking Japanese gangster. I want you to kill him and I want you to kill every one of his men. I want you to turn his house into a bloodbath. Don't leave anybody alive. They are all willing to lose their police badges and resign from the force as long as they take down the Katana gang once and for all. Now you're talking. Why did you come under? Because I'm an undercover cop. They make it into the Katana gang's headquarters and simply raise hell. One man doesn't yield to Frank and dies in an epic display of slow motion destruction. Another man finds himself unable to kill Joe after dodging and hiding amongst trees. Frank teaches him a lesson about how to die by ironically shooting him until he dies. They make it into the house, dramatically getting into shootouts with the guards. Blood from bullet wounds are delayed, and the reactions to being shot are exceptional. Joe discovers his budget doppelganger disputing about whose hair is better. Spoiler alert, Joe's hair is and always will be the best. Samurai, drop your gun or your sweetheart will be dead. Fujiyama holds Jennifer hostage and tries to make a deal with Joe and Frank. He explains that he just wants to leave the country and doesn't want any more problems with the police. He says that if they don't drop their guns, then he will kill her. Accepting the reality of the situation, Joe disarms and tells Frank to do the same. He's not stupid. He doesn't want to do the killing himself. Go ahead and drop it, Frank. You American cops aren't as smart as I thought you were. Fujiyama, baffled by their stupidity, shoots Frank in the chest. As he's about to do more damage, Frank twists his body up to shoot Fujiyama. He's alive! Frank, you all right, man? Yeah. <laughs> With all his money and success, He's not as smart as I am. To do what? Put on a bulletproof vest, man. I got one more thing to take care of. What? Yamashita. He's still alive. After kissing his newfound love goodbye, Joe and Frank head off to take down the rest of the gang and kill Yamashita. It's kind of funny that they already killed the leader of the gang, but the person that they are actually after is the number one man. I would have assumed that by killing the leader, it would effectively disband the gang, but I guess not. Look out, Joe. Don't worry. One of the gang members busts out of a door, and by this point, I believe they officially ran out of money. He is supposedly shot by Joe and falls to the ground with no bullet wound or blood in sight. 
The two sleeveless, long-haired men go at it, one on the roof and another on the ground level. Joe, having a distinct advantage because he is the samurai cop, shoots the man on the roof. After a couple of others are shot dead without a trace of being scratched, Yamashita joins the party by rolling up in the shortest jeep known to man. Like Joe, it's a sleeveless sort of day. The shootouts commence as Yamashita wants to know what Joe is really made of. Hey Joe, so they call you Samurai. Let's see how good you are with the sword. Samurai Super Cop. We prepare ourselves for a samurai battle of a lifetime. Two opposing forces bound by the sword of pure will and love of the culture. Joe contorts his face in ways that I didn't think was possible. He has transcended the original samurai and has been born anew, a man forged from battle-hardened steel, sharpened in the night by diamond hands. <laughs> Joe uses his strength that only the gods could comprehend. Yamashita cannot believe his eyes. Is he really being bested by a mere mortal? Unfortunately for Yamashita, Joe is no mortal. He is a samurai god master of killing and master of discipline through combat. The battle rages on, pressure points are prodded, while tendons and ligaments are torn. Joe gains the upper hand once and for all, knowing full well that he's had it all along. You lost. You lost face. Yamashita understands his defeat, telling Joe that he must be executed by the code. You know the code of the Bushida? Kill me. To him, when a samurai is defeated, he must be beheaded by the victor. No, Joe, you're a cop. But Joe is easily talked down by Frank, who reminds him that he is a cop. Yamashita then takes matters into his own hands. What, what is he doing? No. Leave him alone. He's a samurai. He wants to die with honor. <laughs> After defeating an entire gang of well-trained samurais, Joe is finally able to get back to what he truly cares about, embracing his heartthrob, womanizing personality by making love on the beach. Wow, what a movie, huh? I didn't know what to expect when I first saw this. It always baffles me how movies like this are made and how they had so many people willing to participate. A movie like this though can really just be made with a camera. Other than the explosion at the beginning and occasional blood, it seems that few resources were actually used. There were quite a few actors here with many of the women willing to be naked on screen. Personally, it would be difficult not to get naked in a movie with Joe, but I would want it to be better written at least. This movie had no budget. The actors were left to their own devices with little preparation from the director and production. I mean, they had to wear their own clothes to the set, which makes it even more awesome because it's almost breaking the fourth wall and blurring the lines between character and actor. The dialogue was the worst offender of all. We could tell that the actors had to force some of these lines out without feeling foolish. Overall, the movie is a fun watch that may grow on you, like a benign tumor just hanging out. It's not contributing anything to your life, but it's not completely destroying it either. Please comment down below with a movie that you might want me to cover. If you enjoyed, please like and subscribe. Next time you see a samurai master with long hair that you cannot keep your eyes off of, think of Joe and his ability to destroy any bad guys that get in his way. Now